Now, before we get into the actual before and after blood work results, it's very important to understand that there's no standardized testing or availability of serum follistatin levels or serum myostatin levels. Can't test it anywhere. Here are the before and after pics. In both pictures, I'm 105 kilos, so that's a nice recomping effect. Both pictures, I'm taking 625 milligrams testosterone and nothing else, and the ancillaries that I mentioned. And in the after picture, I was running up to 900 milligrams apicatogen at least for 10 days at the end of this experiment. So I got leaner overall, which I'm happy with. Again, caloric restriction, cardio, uh, that kind of stuff, right? That's to be expected. How much of this fat loss came from epicatogen? I'm not sure, but it has been shown scientifically to enhance fat loss to a certain extent and improve insulin sensitivity. Um, I got a little bit bigger, I would say. Hey, my arms are a little bit bigger, legs are certainly bigger, but that's also because I was only training legs for, what, three or four weeks after taking two months off after that leg surgery. So uh, give me a little bit of a break when it comes to the legs, right? That's um, a project that is in the making. I'm sure my legs will improve when I switch to YK11 and then Follistatin 344 as part of this Operation Follistatin experiment. My vacuum is a little bit deeper, a lot more details. My lower chest is a lot more defined. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with these results. And the detail in my legs is also better and the volumization of the calves and the quads and the adductors even is improved. Also, in the back, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think you, you guys can clearly see that I have more details in my shoulders, arms, and uh, back and hamstrings even. In the before picture, I wasn't really flexing properly. Again, when you take a couple of weeks off from the gym, you're also not flexing. So my flexing, uh, my posing practice is basically non-existent. I pose when I take before and after pictures. Uh, and that's about it. I'm not a full-time hardcore bodybuilder anymore. I take my pictures once a month, <laughs> give or take. Uh, but I got noticeably leaner in the lower back and a little bit more detail in the arms, a little bit more volume in the arms, legs look a little bit bigger. So I would say that it's good progress for a month. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with the results. Now, before we get into the actual before and after blood work results, it's very important to understand that there's no standardized testing or availability of serum follistatin levels or serum myostatin levels. Can't test it anywhere. I found some sort of source online that offers follistatin testing at home, but you still need to get that prescribed through a primary healthcare physician in the United States. And my insurance is not there and I don't work with a doctor in the United States. So that's completely off the table. I contacted a water accredited lab here in Thailand, a university that can uh, do all kinds of testing, but they told me that testing for follistatin and myostatin requires a reference standard, which costs several thousand dollars, especially when you uh, reuse this reference standard and compare my serum follistatin and myostatin levels to this reference standard multiple times before the uh, epicatogen experiment and then after the epicatogen experiment, which is before the YK11 experiment, and then before the Follistatin 344 experiment and then afterwards again, it would have cost me thousands of dollars. And by the time I realized this, it was already too late because it takes a while for these reference standards of Follistatin and Myostatin to come uh, through. Uh, that has to be approved and ordered, obviously. So unfortunately, Follistatin and Myostatin, I didn't test. It's basically impossible. Um, and I don't think it was worth a couple thousand dollars to test that for a supplement that uh, people are going to take anyway. Uh, it's entirely up to your decision. My blood work parameters are not going to pivot you from taking it or not taking it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I have this money stuffed in a sock under a couch somewhere, but I'd rather spend this money on Incrolex, which I know will yield me much better results than knowing my serum follistatin or serum myostatin levels. So maybe we can interpret my before and after blood work results with the side effects associated with chronically elevated follistatin levels. It has an effect on the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis shown as a reduced follicle stimulating hormone levels in serum which might affect fertility downstream. This was first observed when follistatin levels were increased in various human studies and animal models. And this is actually why follistatin is named follistatin, because it's, um, well, it's a statin for follicle stimulating hormone, but it has a potential benefits regarding muscle growth and the inhibition of myostatin. Um, so the naming convention is a little bit off. Uh, regarding the actual effects. Chronically elevated follistatin levels might cause insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, shown as elevated blood glucose levels, elevated fasting insulin levels, elevated triglyceride levels, and elevated hemoglobin A1C levels. And follistatin may impair insulin signaling in adipose tissue and promote lipolysis, which was shown in scientific evidence, proving that epicatogen might actually improve fat metabolism, albeit in obese individuals. I was a little bit obese before we started this experiment and I certainly got fat loss. Did that come from the caloric restriction 
or the follicytin increased caused by the epicathogen, I guess we'll never know. Chronically elevated follicytin levels might cause hepatic stress or dysfunction, shown as elevated liver enzymes, ALT and AST, but those might also be elevated from vigorous exercise as these aminotransferases are leaking from skeletal muscle, giving you a false positive on uh, liver stress or dysfunction. Chronically elevated follicytin levels can cause thyroid dysfunction shown by elevated free thyroxine levels. It can cause kidney stress shown by elevated creatinine levels and albumin levels. It can cause systemic inflammation shown by elevated high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels, elevated interleukin-6 levels, and elevated cystatin C levels. Guess which one of these is significantly elevated? And uh, chronically elevated follicytin levels might have a disease risk, including insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Let's get into the blood work results, make a mental note of these potential side effects of chronically elevated follicytin levels, and then see uh, how my blood work parameters have changed over the last four weeks. But I'll um, do my due diligence explaining to you guys where these changes could potentially be coming from. So here's the blood work results from February 22nd, 2025, about a month ago, and March 23rd, 2025, that's a couple of days ago. In my urine analysis, you see that it's pretty comparable, even though the pH of my urine uh, the last couple of days was very, very low, so in indicating high acidity. Could be coming from additional protein metabolism. Very common for acidity of the urine to be a little bit higher when you consume a lot of protein, and my protein intake is over 300 grams per day. So that uh, might be a cause of it. And I was not as hydrated as the previous uh, urinalysis results, because you can see in my specific gravity that on February 22nd, it was 1.005, and on March 23rd, it was 1.009, even though in both instances, I consumed at least two liters of water. And all of the other results are the same within normal parameters. So let's move over to the complete blood count. White blood cell count, a small change of half a percent. Hemoglobin, a small change of half a percent. Hematocrit, exactly the same. Red blood cell count, a change of 1%. Mucopolis volume, mucopolis hemoglobin, mucopolis hemoglobin concentration, uh, all small changes of let's say half percent to one half percent up. Red cell distribution with a small change of four percent. Platelet count, a small change of minus three percent. And regarding my white blood cell differential, a little bit more significant changes. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils changed to normal parameters. But I think I had a little bit of a sickness, a little bit of a sniffle, a little bit of a cough. Uh, on February 22nd. So uh, last time I was probably slightly sick or coming down with something I can't remember honestly. And then now a couple of days ago, I was perfectly healthy. And the other parameters are exactly the same within normal parameters. Regarding blood chemistry and kidney function, blood glucose increased by 6%. I don't think that's indication of insulin resistance or full-blown type 2 diabetes from chronically elevated follicytin levels. Blood urea nitrogen actually improved by about 10% from 27.9 to 24.8 milligrams per deciliter, uh, even though my protein intake is exactly the same. So could be a hydration issue. Creatinine did increase from 1.34 to 1.42 so uh, milligrams per deciliter. So that's an increase of 6%. Is that from chronically elevated um, follicytin levels from the epicatogen going up to 900 milligrams daily, or just because I gained more muscle mass and lost uh, body fat, ending up the exact same weight. I think that's more likely because I also got stronger, obviously, as this experiment progressed. Cis increased by about 6% from 0 0.7 to 0 0.74 milligrams per liter, which I say is a normal fluctuation. Usually I'm about 0 0.68 to 0 0.8 milligrams per liter, uh, depending on how hydrated I am and how much my body weight is. So for 105 kilos, I would say that this is a normal result. Uric acid is the same. Creatine phosphokinase and lactose dehydrogenase increased by, let's say, 6 to 14%, give or take. Now, I'm, I'm not worried about that. Uh, increased CPK and increased LDH is just common with increased training intensity. And since my creatinine went up and my liver enzymes also went up, I would say that it's all coming from training intensity, not from potential kidney problems or potential liver problems, like I highlighted in the uh, potential side effects of chronically elevated folostatin levels. What is surprising and alarming, and I'm very concerned about, is an increase of 7,200% in my high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. On February 22nd, before I ever took epicatogen, my high-sensitivity C-reactive protein was 0.3 milligrams per liter. And now, March 23rd, 30 days on epicatogen, going up to 900 milligrams epicatogen daily, 21.8 milligrams per liter. That's an increase of 7,200%. <laughs> you would need to have cancer 
or you would need to inject copious amounts of injectable anadrol uh, suspended in glycol or injectable adianabol suspended in glycol to get your high sensitivity C-reactive protein up this high. You know what's funny? I don't feel like I have elevated uh, C-reactive protein. I don't feel inflamed. My joints don't hurt, right? I didn't get any problems with my joints over the last couple of weeks that I've been using epicatogen. So this could either be a one-off or a real result. I did take the epicatogen out. I will check my high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels this Sunday. So that's a week after discontinuing epicatogen as I will check my homocysteine levels because I didn't test that this time. And I will check my uh, ferritin levels, which are all markers of inflammation. Unfortunately, I can't check for the other inflammatory markers like interleukin-6. Um, so this is the best I can do for now. I will test it a week after discontinuing the epicatogen to see if high sensitivity C-reactive protein came down to approximately half because the half-life of C-reactive protein is approximately five days, give or take. It usually takes a week for that to come down significantly. If it's exactly the same, it's something else that I'm taking or doing um, or environmental pollution, which I don't think, I mean, the PPM in Bangkok is kind of high, but it's not that high that my C-reactive protein would be 218 milligrams per liter, I mean, that's fucking high, dude. Um, so it could either come from the epicatogen or the bioperine, even though both have been associated with antioxidant effects and anti-inflammatory effects, so it shouldn't cause such an increase of C-reactive protein. It could be some of the binder that this ND company uses in their uh, minus epicatogen extract formulation, causing my C-reactive protein to get that high. Again, I have digestive issues, so maybe it's something in there that is um, causing my C-reactive protein to get that up. Maybe it's bound with gluten. It uh, could be the case. Who knows? Uh, they don't disclose that on the product packaging from what I remember reading. Um, so that could be the case. Or my uh, follistatin levels are so high that the only real observable effect on my blood work is uh, f***ing high CRP levels. So again, time will tell. I'll do blood work this Sunday and then mix in the results right after we finish the blood work results as an add-on segment.